On behalf of the Wall City Lahore Authority, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all. This afternoon, Mrs. Noshin Sarfaraz, president of the Amateur Gardeners Club Lahore and one of Pakistan's most innovative and dynamic horticulturists, will be presenting her research on the floral frescoes at Masjid Wazir Khan. The Mughals were one of the greatest empire builders, starting from the 16th century to their decline at the late 18th century. Like any new empire, the Mughals felt a strong need to assert their importance over a vast variety and territory of people ranging from different religions and cultures. They asserted their claim to universal rule through a multicultural viewpoint. Masjid Wazir Khan was commissioned by Ilmuddin Ansari, also known as Wazir Khan, in 1634, during the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan. The mosque in its grandeur maintains a sense of humility through design and decoration, as the floral motifs allude to the perfection of nature. Through careful orchestration of flower ornamentation, Shah Jahan illustrated the bloom of the empire under his benevolent rule. The, empire, the Mughals understood that empires were not just built on conquest, but by exercising their power through means other than that showcased on the battlefield. By enhancing the potential of art and architecture of the region as a means of self-representation, they drew inspiration from many diverse supra-regional and regional traditions, which combined and imperialized validated their rule to the widest possible audience as ideal and universal kings. I would like to invite Mr. Kamran Lashari, Director General, Wall City Lahore Authority, to talk about the projects and initiatives being taken by the said authority. Mr. Kamran Lashari, would you please say a few okay, words? Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. I welcome the viewers who are today basically gathered for uh, listening to Noshim Sarfraz, the exposition of the Wazir Khan Mosque. Let me introduce my uh, mehekma or my department. It's a dedicated body for uh, an autonomous body called Wall City Lahore Authority, meant for the rehabilitation of the old city of Lahore. So this comprised the 12 gates, the, the traditional gates through which the people used to enter the city. So whatever historic asset is there, we are trying to rehabilitate it. Rehabilitation would mean one is that um, redoing the infrastructure, um, that is the sewerage, the water system, the gas lines, and even the dangling wires up uh, above your head, they have been dropped down. I'm talking about just, uh, let's say, one-tenth of the area, which is our project area. That has been done uh, in this fashion, and the, and the um, shops and uh, the houses above have also been dealt with. Their facades have been treated. And most of all, certain monuments falling on, the, the, uh, on this uh, route, which we call the Royal Trail. One is the, uh, one is the Shahi uh, Bath, the, the, the Hammam, Shahi Hammam, the, the only surviving Turkish bath, uh, which has been now restored through our Khan Trust for Culture, who has, who has worked with us. And uh, this has gained international recognition. This has got the UNESCO award. William Dalapel commented on, uh, in his Twitter that this is the best restoration project that he has seen in the entire South Asia. So uh, we have also uh, gone up to the Masjid Wazir Khan, where the exterior of the mosque has been rehabilitated. And uh, you see, uh, there were about more than 70 shops which had surrounded the mosque and uh, encroached upon the certain portions, defaced the mosque. So all those have been uh, compensated and removed. And the actual levels of the mosque, uh, the courtyard, the, the, the frontal area called the chalk, the choraha, has uh, been uh, converted into a community space, which earlier was uh, most chaotic, uh, encroached place. And uh, so, so I'm very glad that we could do this and restore this jewel of a place called Bazir Khan Mosque, 
to, to its original form. But our interior areas have yet to be done and uh, we, we are on it, uh, again, with the uh, Trust for Culture on this. And so um, I, I don't want to take too much of time, but we are doing a lot of work in the fort also, the picture wall, the, sh the Shahi Babarchi Khana, then the, um, the bunkers, the British uh, Emanation Depot, and uh, the Divane Khas, and the Makatab Khana, all these are being, being uh, conserved. So, so this conservation work is a, is a great joy to work and to, not only that, in fact, I think the strength of our department has been to use some of these spaces uh, and bring them into public use and uh, bring them into life. Well, Masjid Wazir Khan Chowk is the best example of that and also the courtyard of uh, the Shahi uh, Babarchi Khana as well as the Shahi Hammam. So, so enjoy yourself, you just see the magic, the majesty and the magnificence uh, reflected through the artwork of the Masjid Wazir Khan, which uh, nobody can do a better job than the floral explanation by, by Nosheen. So over to you, Nosheen. Thank you very much for giving us time and making our viewers understand uh, all this. Thank you, sir. I would like to uh, invite Ms. Nosheen Sarfaraz to tell us more about the mysteries of the frescoes at Masjid Nazir Khan. Ms. Nosheen Sarfaraz. Thank you, Kamran Saab and Malika Lara. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined today in the webinar regarding Masjid Nazir Khan from uh, Indonesia, from Thailand, from India, from UK and USA, and of course from our own country. Welcome to the Masjid Wazir Khan webinar. What I would like to tell you that the Masjid Wazir Khan Mosque has been on the tentative UNESCO World Heritage List. And the mosque is situated in the heart of the wall city. And according to a European, its artwork is calling to be read and analyzed. It was built by Ilmuddin Ansari, who was the royal physician of Shah Jahan, who later became the governor of Lahore. And he chose the, the site for building a mosque, which was central to Lahore at that time in 1634. And what I would like to tell you that the mosque is like situated about 15, 20 minutes drive from my house, but because it was so inaccessible, that I had never been there. Although I had read a lot about the mosque, that it is a school in itself, but I was never able to understand what did that mean. It was only when the Wall City Department under Mr. Kamran Lashari opened up the place and Kamran Saab asked me to bring the first group of the gardeners, amateur gardener club members to see what restoration work they have done. So it was a hundred gardening club members who visited the Masjid Wazir Khan and it was the first group who visited it. And although the members enjoyed whatever was there and you know, it was beautiful, but for me, it was an unbelievable experience because what I saw was the flowers painted over there and those flowers I had seen six months back in the Netherlands during a visit. There were fritillarias, there were tulips, there were lilium. So, I mean, what were those flowers doing in the Lahore of 1634? Whereas nowadays, nobody knows about their growing in Pakistan. And if you ask them, people would say, oh, they grow in America, they grow in UK, or they grow in Europe and all but they don't grow over here. So how come those flowers are growing over there? Did it mean that the Indians at that time, the people living in the subcontinent knew about their growing 400 years ago? I had worked with a Dutch floriculturist, his name was Peter Lagrov, and he was growing good quality cut flowers in Lahore. For, he worked over here for about five to six years. And we decided, 
to have a, a workshop for the local growers of Pakistan so that they can become familiar with the quality cut flowers. And we imported 30 different kinds of cut flowers from Holland. When the flowers came and I opened one of the tulip boxes and exclaimed, Peter, they are beautiful. He said, don't be silly. We stole them from you 400 years ago. We developed them and we are selling them all over the world. You people, you have stopped growing them and consequently you, you have forgotten how to grow them. Now, after all this, you know, I thought that in our gardening club, we are going to make Masjid Wazir Khan a part of our 10 months agenda. Every year we have an agenda that we follow once a month. So we made Masjid Wazir Khan and its flower work an agenda. And we took presentations from our local experts. And the local from the first local expert that came was Mr. Oriam Abuljan. And what he told us was that do you think the people in that time were they illiterate? The literacy rate was 97% at that time. And he said, everybody, whether in the villages or in the cities, they used to study astronomy, astrology, mathematics. And if a Muslim, they would read the Quran. If a Hindu, they would read the weather. And if a Christian, the Bible. And he said, you see all these beautiful buildings, so precision and such a, uh, excellent precision over there. Do you think they were made by ordinary masons? Those people were highly educated. That's why they were able to do this kind of work. So he said, according to him, it's no big deal that those flowers could be grown over there or in, uh, in around Lahore around that time. And another important uh, uh, presentation that we took from uh, Mr. Uh, Shokat Mahmood, who was from the Punjab University, he said that, you know, at that time, the people uh, who, uh, the artisans and all the experts, they never liked to project their own names while they were working. They wanted their work to be projected and their work to say that, you know, this has been done by this person. That is why you don't see any names written on the Masjid Wazir Khan or on the other Mughal buildings. So this is the beautiful tradition which we need to revive because nowadays it is like the name first and the work later. So the old tradition needs to be revived and this is a beautiful tradition. Another important aspect of the fresco paintings in Masjid Wazir Khan is that during a one year correspondence course that I did from the University of Pennsylvania called Floristry and Floral Design. Uh, similar concepts were taught to us that I see painted in Masjid Wazir Khan. During an attempt to read, analyze, identify the flowers with respect to their identification, design, color, and arrangement. One arrangement is particularly worth mentioning that took a month for me to figure out the concept and the identity of the flowers. The design has fritillarias, tulips, dianthus, hydrangeas, daisy, bearded iris, marigolds, and clarkia. And the design concept is called Mili di Fleur, taught by the University of Penn, which means the use of a thousand flowers. This design features a collection of varied but contemporary floral material radiating broadly from a central point and has a strong European flavor. In terms of density, the strongest area of the, of the design is the center. The most common shape of Mili Di Fleur arrangement are round and oval, as can be seen in the Masjid Wazir Khan paintings. There is no conscious attempt to establish a line, however. The line is not totally absent, but when it appears having less importance in emphasis. The design calls for a large quantity of flowers and foliage. Floral compatibility, design shape and mood have to be considered when choosing flowers and there is a smooth transition from one size to the other. The Milidi Fleur looks best when color combinations are vibrant, alive and at times contrasting. 
The style is cheerful and uplifting and makes the viewer feel good about being alive to enjoy the beauties of nature. Container in this style should be in proportion to the total piece and it has a major influence on the arrangement size. Now I would like to share a little presentation that I made uh, uh, on the fresco work of Masjid Wazir Khan. Uh, Zen, the presentation of Abdullah. Mm -hmm. Presentation. Okay. Regarding the presentation, I would like to say that we are not makers of history, rather we are made by history, as Martin Luther King Jr. once said. First up. Now this is the fresco flowers of Masjid Wazir Khan and a little presentation that I made next. This is how the place was before the Wall City people arrived. The previous condition of the Wazir Khan Chok. After removal of encroachments, this is when all the encroaching things were removed. And how it is Masjid Wazir Khan Chok now. So this is a painted flower arrangement at Masjid Wazir Khan with fritillarias, tulip, dianthus, hydrangeas, daisy, bearded iris, marigolds, and clarkia, 1635. Next. This is a Chinese blue vase. Flowers include bearded iris, tulips, buditias, marigolds. This is an analogous color scheme, which means it's a color scheme featuring colors so close in hue that no contrast is produced. But it has that contrast of design. It is that principle of design that compares objects to highlight their differences, dissimilar colors, lines, forms, sizes, or shapes to give the design a harmony. Next. The blue was with the red background. The flowers include buds of bearded iris, tight dianthus buds, one narcissus on top, or neath of gallant thyroside, starlight. The composition is such that the grouping of an individual parts to form a unified whole. There is a balance or an equal distribution of weight in the floral design. The next arrangement with a yellow background. Flowers include Marigold cluster, bearded iris, two colors, dianthus, narcissus. A beautiful design which has a distinctive presentation and a good execution. Looks like a circular design which is rounded in dome shape, clustering. Majority of the design technique have groups of identical floral arrangements which are placed in arrangements with little or no space between them. Next, bearded iris. A beautifully, perfectly executed bearded iris plant that are the rage in Europe, America nowadays, but sadly has become extinct here. Look at the perfect imitation of the foliage shape, which if we Google now, shows us the tall bearded iris. You can see that on the Google, the picture. Echinacea, or the cone flower. Echinacea is a group of herbaceous flowering plants in the daisy family. This genus has nine species commonly called the cone flower. They are found only in Eastern and Central North America, where they are found growing in moist to dry prairie, sand open wooded areas. They are listed in US as endangered species. This is the picture of Echinacea when you Google it. Then we come to the fritillaria or the imperial crown. Next. The award-winning fritillaria imperialis maxima lutea is a most impressive bulbous herbaceous perennial with its beautiful display of yellow, orange, pendant, bell-shaped flowers topped by a crown of small leaves rising high at the end of an upright stem 
wearing lance shaped glossy leaves. Growing up to 40 to 44 inches, it was granted the prestigious award of garden merit by RHS in 1993 and has been quite popular since its introduction 400 years ago. Next. This is Fritillaria. When you Google, Google it. Next. The blue vase arrangement. The flowers include <clears throat> marigold at the base, cluster of jasmine, bearded iris, dianthus. Looks like a design concept of layering, which is a design technique where materials of different textures are placed in arrangement space with little or no space in between them. There is a line or a path the eye follows in a design. The rose bush, the beautiful pink rose bush identification from the serrated leaves. Next. Narcissus. A clear picture of Narcissus emphasis on the leaf texture shape. Next. Lilium fresco in Masjid Bazir Khan. From the Dutch bulbous catalog, it looks like Lilium speciosum with special emphasis on the structure of the plant leaves and shape and the droopy flowers. Next. These are some of the pictures which are taken by one of our gardening club members, Rashida Raza, and she took really nice pictures of some of the flowers. And it looks, looks like they are marigold and clarkia in a blue vase. And this looks like Bearded iris, the blue bearded iris in a blue vase. Next. Now this is an important, you know, this is uh, a sunflower. The sunflower, uh, the beautiful sunflower, and looks like the hybrid sunflower, which is, uh, you know, painted over there. Next. Again, the sunflower. Next. Here you see the echinaceae, the cone flower. And if you can see at the back, you can see the cone flower, which I'm going to show you in, in the, towards the end also. Next. Echinacea and sunflower in Masjid Wazir Khan Fresco, 1635. Next. And the sunflowers and echinacea is grown by Murtaza today for the Masjid Wazir Khan webinar. And after this, in 2017, we, I uh, decided that we are going to have a bulbous show in Bagh and uh, we planted uh, different kinds of bulbs imported from Holland. Next. These are the bulbs arriving from Holland. Next. This is the tulip shaped flower bed that I saw in Holland that the, uh, the bed was in the shape of a tulip and about 2000 bulbs were planted in each bed. The bulbs planted in rectangular beds. Next. The Asiatic lilies were planted. Lily Sobon. This is the Lilium original love. Asiatic Lilium. Asiatic Lilium again. Tall stemmed pink tulips. This is all in, in Bagajina. And by the way, I will tell you that this show was planned uh, in collaboration with PHA, who did all the funding, I did all the technical advice, and uh, uh, the, the plants, uh, the bulbs, and the material, the, bulb, the bulbs are all imported from Holland, whereas the growing soil was all our local soil. It was, nothing was like uh, um, imported. The soil or the, uh, uh, the growing material it was not imported. It was all local. Next. This is the vibrant red tulips. This is 2017, the yellow daffodils. The, the double tulip, which is called a peony. The ranunculus from bulbs. And the ranunculus in full bloom in Bagajina. Next. So, so end up the carbon. Next. So this is the, almost the last of the. Let's go to some of them.
This was the end of the bulbous show. Now, uh, what I would like to tell you is that we are planning, inshallah, uh, in Pakistan, that we are going to have a program every year by Almighty's grace and all called Pakistan Blooms. And it's going to be an event that will take place in the five major cities of Pakistan, starting from Karachi to Lahore, Islamabad, Peshawar, and Quetta. Now, the aim of Pakistan Blooms is that we are going to develop our local gardens in the initial stage and grow good quality flowers over there with the local help and then open it for the public and we want all the floral art clubs to be a part of it and to develop good gardening practices among the among all the people they should learn how to grow good quality flowers with the with our local material not with imported stuff and it should be readily available to them and then maybe later on with you know when the pandemic and all is better we can have something like the the chelsea show or maybe like the Kukenhof gardens develop something like that in pakistan and to develop garden tourism over here so there are multi uh, factors of pakistan blooms and one of them is also to grow good quality cut flowers over here to enable our growers to grow good quality cut flowers in the local soils and how to go about so this is going to promote our floricultural industry and i would like that all of you should be a part of it and um, uh, with the gardening club i think uh, we are going to have every month uh, a sort of a zoom meeting in which uh, we are going to um, emphasize because this year the agenda of our gardening club is also a very interesting one and one is to <clears throat> develop sustainable gardening in lahore and the other is the teachings of gregor lersh who was the uh, europe's uh, grandmaster in floral design how his teachings i have um, applied to landscaping so uh, that's going to be a part of the agenda and we are going to apply that to pakistan blooms also and we would like that everybody in pakistan from all cities they should be a part of this program so if you have any queries if you have any um, uh, uh, things that you want to ask please you can email me or you can uh, whatsapp me and uh, we would like that you should be a part of the next zoom meetings that we are going to have so now i would like to thank you all for joining us on the masjid wazir khan webinar and i hope you have enjoyed this and because for me it was a joy to learn it was in the beginning an unbelievable experience to see all the flowers but later on when i realized that they have been growing over here and we can grow them over here it became a source of joy so i hope i can impart that joy to all of you all over Thank you. I love this. Hello. Malgalro. Ji, uh, ma'am, I would like to. That we have a question here that yes. uh, they want to ask you: Which um, institute um, offers these floricultural courses? in pakistan g in pakistan uh that is the sad part over here that our um, institutions in pakistan are not really up to the mark i would say although 
there is a department of floriculture in Bagajina and they do have some uh, uh, you know courses for ladies as well as for gents the gardening courses but um, I would say they are not up to the mark and if you uh, like go to the agricultural universities and all maybe they offer some kind of floriculture um, courses over there so uh, one can try that but other than that i don't think so not in lahore at least but we need to you know develop these kind of things at the institutional level because people need to get educated how to go about and you know our country is an agrarian economy so it's all the more important that people have to learn how to go about and I strongly feel that Pakistan has a big potential in floriculture and we can grow so many things. We are blessed by Almighty with such good soil, with such good climate and everything. And it's only the lack of know-how and the lack of experimentation that people are not, you know, growing things over here. But we can grow almost everything. And the best thing is, that you can grow beautiful foliage in Pakistan because our weather is so suitable to growing foliage over here. And whereas, you know, in, in the Netherlands and in those areas where the, the temperatures are very cold and all, they really have to work hard to grow these things. I mean, they need a greenhouse and they have to have the heating and all that. Whereas over here, just with a plain netting, with a green net, we can grow the most exquisite and the most beautiful foliage in Pakistan. Another question is, another question is, um, you're part of the Amateur Gardeners Club Lahore. Can't um, that be a base to start the courses? And um, can, uh, is there a place where they can, is Amateur Gardeners Club a place where they can start to learn the basics of um, gardening? <laughs> Actually, in the gardening club, I write newsletters for my members every month. And it's like 10 months in a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that newsletter, I write what needs to be done in your garden, the things that you need to work, how to improve your soil, how to counter the different problems that you have in your garden. And for the past few years, I have become, uh, you would say, an advocate of growing organic, uh, to do organic gardening. And I don't like to use uh, insecticides and pesticides. And I like to uh, use the natural uh, things in countering the fungal infestations, the pest infestation. And I like to control my plants with the soil because that is very important. And this is what people usually don't do. They, they just want to spend money on the most expensive seed or the plant or this, but you know, the soil is the base and you cannot avoid a good soil base and just concentrate on a, on a big plant or an expensive plant. So, mm -hmm. and the soil uh, mixtures that I've tried to develop over the last few years are all local mixtures, nothing is imported. And mm -hmm. I would say like most of those things are, uh, uh, they are a sort of waste. For example, the rice ash that I, I'm a strong advocate of rice ash. In fact, I've written a paper on the different kinds of ashes, which can be used as a soil amendment and uh, uh, how they improve your soil and your flowers and the problems that you can have in your soil. So maybe if anyone is interested, I can share that with them too. There are a lot of people interested. <laughs> I would, uh, another question is, what are the alternative uh, pesticides that you use? You just talked about there are many things. One, uh, one very uh, uh, the common thing that we are using is the neem oil, the concentrate neem oil that we have, and it is diluted in a warm soapy solution. Like mm -hmm. the soapy solution is made uh, with um, uh, it's like a dishwashing solution, like one teaspoon of the dishwashing solution, one liter of 
uh, warm water. First, you make the soapy solution and then you add one tablespoon of the neem oil. And you spray that on all your plants, and especially the edibles like the vegetables, the fruits. And you can see it acts as um, a fungicide as well as an insecticide. So, I mean, if it is a, a mature plant and the infestation is too much, then you can add like one and a half tablespoon of the neem oil. And another thing that you can use for a fungus uh, infestation, like if you have a leaf curl and mm -hmm. you see a sort of a powdery mildew, like a white powder thing on the plant. So an excellent thing that you can use uh, on that is the baking powder, the baking soda. You dissolve like one teaspoon of the baking soda in water, you strain it, and you add a little bit of maybe uh, like a one teaspoon of cooking oil in it and a teaspoon of the, uh, the liquid soap. And you spray the plants with this in the, mo in the morning, like in, in, I would say in full sun. So the baking soda, it uh, acts as an antifungal uh, thing and it removes the fungus uh, uh, problems. I would like to share one experiment. Uh, I like to grow Kashmiri dahlias in my garden and because of their size and all. So uh, every year for the past many years, after the first flush, the plant would die down in winter or it would be affected by fungus. Now this year, this last uh, December, when I saw some signs of fungal infestation on my dahlia plants after the first flush of big flowers, I just made this uh, baking soda solution. And I sprayed the plant every three days without using any other insecticide. And the result was just amazing because the fungus was all gone and the plants became so healthy and there was another fresh uh, flower uh, growth in March and April. So, you know, uh, it's important to know about the old things with the new things. I mean, what we have done is in our, I would say everything in gardening as well as in farming, that uh, we are uh, too obsessed with the new things. I mean, this is a new medicine. This is a new fertilizer. This is a new thing. You use this. And so consequently, we don't stress on the, on the old methods. And one other method that, uh, which is an age old method that is used in the, uh, in the, uh, by the farmers is the use of uh, manure ash. The manure is used as uh, they are, uh, it is used, it is burnt over there and it is used as fuel. So when they burn it, the ash remains there. Now that manure ash is excellent as an antifungal and it acts as a fertilizer. So it has a double reaction, you know. It acts as a fertilizer as well as an antifungal. And in, in the villages, they use it for garlic. So when they plant garlic and onion, they, they like to, when they weed the plants, they sprinkle it uh, around uh, the plants and you know it eliminates fungal problems and plus it helps them to um, become mature and acts as a fertilizer so has a double action thing and something which is waste something that is not used so the different kinds of ashes that you can use in your garden on the different things another experiment that I've done I've been doing it for the past four years is the use of wood ash now in winters you know a lot of people they burn a lot of wood over here i mean outside sitting outside they are burning wood to keep themselves warm now the ash from that wood is excellent for flowers like delphiniums for digitalis and i regularly add that like twice a, twice a week i would say to all those small plants and the results are just amazing 
because the the people who have been coming to my garden in march and april to see the delphiniums they are amazed by the size in fact last year it was argentina's um, ambassador she came uh, over with her husband and she when she saw those delphiniums she said that they are exhibition quality delphiniums what have you fed them with and when i told her that i only feed them with you know the wood ash and it's like every second uh, every third day she was just amazed and she said you're not using any other fertilizer i said well very sparingly i add 2020 but then the wood ash is a permanent thing because it eliminates fungal uh, infestation and because in winters and uh, during the frost again you have some uh, fungus problem and it acts as a fertilizer and the plant really benefits from it and maybe now i need to get the uh, the wood ash analyzed to see uh, the contents so because the flowers really benefit from it and it is something which is going waste but the ash you need to first get it and then strain it because then uh, there are like small lumps in it like the wood lumps or it can be any debris so you need to strain it and make a fine powder and then use that powder on the on the soil another example of the the ashes is the manure ash i would say is like the vegetables that i grow in my house like nowadays i have brinjals outside and it's like one plant is a big bush so whenever i see that there is uh, any sign of uh, like an aphid or a leaf borer what i do is i uh, uh, use a watering shower i wet the plant and then sprinkle that strained uh, uh, manure ash on the whole plant it remains over there for a day and then after that i wash it off with water and the ash is then uh, uh, it goes into the soil so it is helping the roots as well as the as well as the plant so something very simple but something very effective and something that we have you know forgotten thank you so much for such an informative session uh, with noshin sir farad it was very informative and all the participants enjoyed the session and i thank the participants the 70 plus participants that joined us today to take their time out and listen and it was amazing thank you so much on behalf of the wall city lahore authority to take your time and give us your time so thank you again thank you thank you everybody and khuda hafiz goodbye <laughs>